Hello, folks that are joining us. We'll get started in just a minute. First, let's see if the chat's working. So go ahead and put your name, your location, and what organization you're joining us from. I'll read out a few just to make sure it's working. My name is Bailey Keller. I'm with TechSoup, and I'm located in Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. You've got Yvonne in New York, Caroline in Texas, Karen from Georgia. Okay, so that seems to be working pretty well. I'll just give it one more minute because I still see folks joining. Okay. So hello and welcome to today's event. My name is Bailey Keller and I'm a senior program manager at TechSoup. A disaster can seriously impact your organization's operations, whether it's an earthquake, wildfire, hurricane, or human caused calamity. Prepare for the worst and plan for the best with innovative disaster recovery apps. In this public good app house demo event, we will showcase practical solutions that nonprofits can use to ensure that they and their communities are ready to respond when disaster strikes. Public Good App House is a project of Caravan Studios, a division of TechSoup. Okay, so let's discuss how you can engage in today's event. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you want to comment, go ahead and use chat. And don't forget to check your, check your inbox after the event. We'll send an email with the replay, the slides, and resource links within a few business days. And if you learn something cool, please tag at TechSoup on social media. And you can also turn on um, closed captioning by selecting the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're in this community together, so ask a question in the Q&A section and share your learnings with us and your colleagues. Now, before we get into today's content, I want to welcome you to the TechSoup Global Network, especially for those of you who are new here. At TechSoup, we believe technology like smartphones, internet connectivity, training, and more have the power to serve our communities better. And today's speakers with their Tech for Good app demos will give you a good taste of what that looks like in action. And now for the demos. In today's presentation, we have Kat Sellers, Chief Strategy Officer of Needslist, Nicholas Bayer, Public Engagement Manager of Doctors Without Borders, Claire Barnhorn, CEO of Salvas, and Ben Smilowitz, Executive Director of SmartResponse.org, a program of disaster accountability project. So let's thank them for being here with us today. And a final reminder that within a few business days, a recording and the slides and any resource links will be sent to you via email. You can use the Q&A section and tag TechSoup on social media. We'll make sure to take time at the end to answer the questions that you guys have in chat. Okay, so let's welcome Kat Sellers. Kat has worked across the not-for-profit sector for more than 20 years as a program management specialist for more than 11 years. Her experience has included roles in youth employment, international development and humanitarian response, disability equality, homelessness and housing, children and young people, health and research. She holds a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Sussex. Before joining Needslist, she was a regional director of East Africa for Field Ready. And prior to that, she ran global wheelchair programs for Walkabout Foundation and global youth employment programs for business in the community. She'll be showing us Needs List's Respond Local platform, which is a humanitarian platform run by tech company Needs List and allows local organizations to match what they need directly with in-kind suppliers in real time, democratizing humanitarian response. To date, the platform has delivered more than $19 million in aid to over 500,000 beneficiaries across 25 countries, including supporting the resettling of Afghan, Ukrainian, and Venezuelan uh, refugees in the USA, 
and delivering locally made COVID PPE to refugee healthcare workers in Bangladesh, Iraq, Uganda, and Kenya. This presentation will be about their ongoing work in Ukraine and about the global version, which launched in January of 2023. Thanks for joining us, Kat. Hi, thanks for having me. Okay, first slide, please. So I'm Kat from Needs List. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are, about what the problem is that we're trying to solve, what our solution looks like, and I'll give you a really quick demo, and then we'll go to how you can get involved. Slide, please. So Bailey's introduction was great. I'll just be very brief. We are a social enterprise. We're a tech company, and we're passionate about supporting local organizations to ask for what they need when they need it in a humanitarian crisis. Slide, please. And again. So the challenge that we're looking at is around how it is that local organizations in a crisis or conflict can say what they want and have back one. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Bailey. Um, so local organizations in a conflict or crisis can ask for what they want and have those needs met by the international community. What tends to happen in a crisis is lots of organizations from around the world really wanna help and respond, but they don't know how. And so items are often sent without a consignee or organizations are going between themselves, trying to work out how to collect their needs. It's done with WhatsApp groups, it's done with Excel sheets and the, the situation can lead to um, duplication and complexity. Next slide, please. So our solution is to create a tech platform that allows local organizations to post their needs in real time, and then to have other national and international organizations reach out to them and offer to meet those needs. This improves collaboration, um, it helps to support investment in local economies, and it helps us to reach more beneficiaries. Slide, please. So this is what our platform looks like. Let's say that you were to receive an invitation from one of us or click on a link, you come to this page, and this is where you register as an organization, you put your details, it's very similar to any other kind of sign up for a platform. We do some vetting on you and then we approve you. Next slide, please. So once you're approved, you come to this page and these little rectangles that you can see indicate specific needs. And this is um, our Ukraine platform. So these are organizations asking for generators and tea. People can also ask for services and for information. A slide, please. So let's say I wanted to meet one of those needs and I click on one of the little tiles and what pops up here is where it says meet need. It gives me all the information that I need about that organization as well as contact details. It helps me to know how I can deliver aid, where I can deliver aid, and uh, it shows me how many units that organization requires. So say somebody needs 3,000 diapers, I can offer 50, I can offer 100, I can offer all 3,000, and that's all collected here. Next slide, please. So this is the same information in our map view. The map view we think helps organizations to understand where the gaps are in coverage. And if you were to click on one of these little purple tags, it will take you to the same place. So it will give you the information about that need, about the organization and their contact details. Next slide, please. And the final part is a reporting platform. So organizations really like to be able to track their impact. And ours is tracked in dollar value. It's also searchable. So if I'm an organization and I want to see how much aid I've received in January, I can select that. Let's say I wanted to look specifically for generators, I can select that. And I can also have a summary of the dollar value of what I've received or given. Next slide, please. So we have just launched a global platform um, with a specific focus at the minute on Turkey and Syria, but we're, we're around the world. So if you're an organization that wants to offer humanitarian aid, please get in touch. If you're a local organization that requires it, we're also always looking for funding and for partners um, so that we can scale and so that we can support the better delivery of humanitarian aid. You can find us here at this little um, URL, URL at the bottom. Next slide, please or you can get in touch with me directly, or you can come onto our website and get a demo and one of my colleagues or myself will get in touch with you and show you around. Thank you, that's all from me. Thank you, Kat. And I see some questions coming in. As a reminder, we'll address all of them at the very end after all the demos. Okay, next up we have Nicholas Bayer, with public who's a public engagement manager with Doctors Without Borders. Nick is the Public and International Engagement Manager at MSF USA, 
In this role, he plans and coordinates events designed to highlight MSF's operational activities to the general public, humanitarian, medical, and academic audiences. As a part of his work, he leads the MSF USA Missing Maps Mapathon program. Prior to joining in 2017, Nick held positions at the Huffington Post, the World Affairs Council of the Mid-Hudson Valley, and the British House of Commons. Nick is a graduate of Marist College, where he studied political science, international studies, French, and music. He'll be demoing Missing Maps, which is an open collaborative project in which you can help to map areas where humanitarian organizations are trying to meet the needs of people who live at risk of disasters and crises. Thanks for joining us today, Nick. Thanks, Bailey, and hi, everyone. I'm Nick Baer, the Public Engagement Manager at Doctors Without Borders, based in our New York office. Some of you might know Doctors Without Borders by our French name, Médecins Sans Frontières, or we sometimes say MSF. Uh, so we're an international humanitarian aid organization that provides medical care in over 70 countries around the world. And today I want to talk to you about an, ini an initiative called Missing Maps. The Missing Maps project uh, was launched in 2014 by four partnering organizations. That was Doctors Without Borders, the American Red Cross, the British Red Cross, and Humanitarian Open Street Map Team. At the time, uh, you can stay on the first slide, Bailey, thanks. So at the time, these organizations recognized a common problem, which was that our teams working in remote locations didn't have updated or reliable map data. This made it more difficult to respond to emergencies like natural disasters, uh, to set up vaccination campaigns, and to make informed decisions about our operations. The answer that we had was missing maps. And this is a solution that allows supporters of our organizations and members of the general public to volunteer their time to help update OpenStreetMap, which is uh, a map system similar to Google Maps, for example, uh, for those who don't know. And in this, uh, in OpenStreetMap, uh, in, in the Missing Maps program, individuals utilize satellite imagery to essentially crowdsource and update this, uh, this mapping and GIS data. Uh, and so we have three pillars of mapping. On the next slide, you'll see the first pillar, which is uh, called MapSwipe. This is actually a mobile app that you can download, download on your phone. Uh, and we're basically using this to identify which areas might have buildings and structures and roads that we want to map. So it helps uh, bring the data, uh, you know, closer to or, or, or create the projects basically that we'll then use to do the next phase of mapping on the next slide. So you can see uh, some images of our in-person Mapathon events. Uh, we are now back to doing in-person. We also have some hybrid Mapathon events that we do in virtual Mapathons. These are basically opportunities for uh, staff of our organizations and volunteers in the mapping community to teach others how to do mapping. After those, uh, after people create the edits in the map, we have an experienced team of validators who check the work before the third step, which you'll see on the next slide. And this is what we call field mapping. This is where teams on the ground will verify and add additional useful information like street names and building qualifiers. So for this uh, mini demo, I'd like to focus on the second part of mapping, which uh, is done through the humanitarian open street map tasking manager site. You could go to the next slide. Um, and this is where most of the magic happens. Uh, first, you would set up an account uh, and you would complete a training. We have trainings available on the site, or like I mentioned, you could join one of our mapathons and we help you sign up and we teach you how to do this um, and learn how to map. Um, and you can go to the next slide. You can see here, uh, when you go to the tasking manager site, there are many different projects you could map. The one that I am demonstrating for you here is um, in support of teams who are responding to the recent earthquakes in Syria. So you would come here, you get some instructions on what is the objective, what we're trying to map, and then you would uh, contribute there at the bottom, right? You can go to the next slide, Bailey, so you can see what this, this looks like. So when you get in here, you can see the satellite imagery is there in this little pink box. That's the task that each individual would be mapping. Um, and you're essentially tracing over the satellite imagery, the buildings and the roads and things that you uh, are contributing to the map. Then you upload those edits to the system, the validators check it, and then it turns into actual maps. So you can see there just a little bit of a quick view of the, what the tasking manager looks like. And before I wrap up, I just wanna show you that the impact of our work. So I have three more quick slides to show you. On the next slide, um, you'll see a, an example of a map 
in an area of Nigeria that was before there was a mapathon event, before there was a project focusing on this area to update those maps. On the second slide, you'll see just how much detail was added uh, to that map. So you can see it's so much more detail. Um, and then the third one I wanna show you is a real tool that the MSF teams used then to set up operations nearby and in this specific refugee camp. So using the satellite imagery, using the volunteer time from the contributors, we really were able to actually have so much more information that could then be verified and used by the teams on the ground. So what can you do? You can join us um, on the next slide. You can go to, yeah. Uh, so our next virtual mapathon is actually on March 16th. So it's right in a good time. And I'll put the registration link in the chat if anyone's interested to join. But you can also make an account on the tasking manager or you can download the open, or you can download the map swipe app on your mobile as well um, in case you want to teach yourself how to map. It is quite easy to do. And um, I always like this as a program for our organizations because it's one of the only things that some someone can do to actually contribute to the operational work that we're doing other than following us on social, you know, donating to us, uh, joining our team, things like this. And this is a really great volunteering opportunity for folks. So I hope that you will all uh, check it out. Thanks so much, Bailey, back to you. Thank you, Nicholas. Okay, next up, we have Claire Barnhorn, CEO of Solvis. Claire is a long-term humanitarian working for about 15 years in humanitarian aid from field operations to logistics and supply chain with a growing focus on data and technology. She held various positions within MSF, Doctors Without Borders, and supported various other NGOs and UN agencies. She has been described as a humanitarian HDMI USB cable translating operational challenges to enable solutions. Claire is the founder and CEO of Solves and Solves Foundation. The platform provides procurement support for organizations in LMICs. In addition, Solves enables open access knowledge and technical capacity for all through an open access catalog. The demo today will show an online procurement platform supporting organizations with a procurement workflow built by and for the sector. An integrated tender and RFQ platform with open access knowledge and catalog builder. Solvis provides access to over 400,000 suppliers worldwide. And I'm going to actually switch over and have Claire go through her slides. Thank you very much, Bailey, for the introduction and very much thank you to the introduction and being invited here and to the previous uh, presenters. My name is Claire. I am the founder and CEO of Solvos. We are a procurement platform as well as a collaboration platform supporting agencies worldwide with uh, procurement processes. I'm delighted to be in this uh, in this stuff and um, um, having heard the presentations of Kate and Nicholas before, uh, I worked for many years with MSF um, in supply chain and logistics, and I will talk about procurement today, which most of you think might be extremely boring because procurement is not the most sexy subject, but it's actually one of the key um, expenditure of any NGO working in humanitarian aid. And the reason why we set up Solvos is that we see needs rising globally and funding isn't going up in the same pace. Last year, we were only able to cover 55 of the UN global appeals for the most, emerge, uh, most urgent humanitarian needs globally. So what we have looked at is making sure that the money that we do have to be spent as efficiently and as effectively as possible. And with procurement activities being over 65% of any humanitarian budget, that's why we focus on uh, procurement and try to make it as efficient and specifically as effective as possible. Solvos is a procurement platform, so that's the second platform, but the first platform, so we have an integrated solutions with two entities, which the solutions catalog is maintained by the Solvos Foundation, where we provide open access knowledge for everybody. And we help to think through, if you have a need, for example, for light, um, you don't procure a generator because that's equal power, but you actually go to the use case and you have the criteria, your technical specifications, so you don't need to be a technical specialist to procure the most efficient solutions. We integrate this with a procurement platform. The tenders and requests for quotations are generated automatically, all compliant to donor rules and regulations, and those are sent out automatically already to the suppliers in the database, which are currently over 400,000. 
So this is the platform. If you go to solvos.com, this is what you will see. If you have a, an account, you can sign in. You can browse through, you can also Google. So I'll give a mass vaccination um, solution as an example. So this is a solution for a mass vaccination site. We give a description. We show all the information from an operational perspective. You need to know how it scales, etc. We give all the items. This is a kit that are in such a kit in order to respond and set up a vaccination campaign. And then you know that all the products in such a kit like this vaccine carrier is fit for purpose. There's dozens of vaccine carriers, but how do you know which one to select to be fit for purpose? We also add attachments to uh, support the logisticians as well as operational staff as much as possible with the full life cycle, the full uh, path on such a campaign. And most importantly, we also add prerequisites. So what do you need to have in place in order to set up a vaccination campaign? You don't need only the um, renewal of the supplies, but you also need to know that allergic reactions can take place. And if you're not prepared for a, um, allergic reactions, you can actually go to the next kit and you can add this to your basket. If you've added to your basket, you can collaborate on multiple baskets with your team. If you're a small NGO, uh, we would like to give you the, the same procurement capacity as any massive NGO out there. Um, if you work with multiple projects, you can have multiple baskets and collaborate with as many colleagues as you want. You can create your basket, you can modify, um, you can prepare your tender. So this is the second workflow where we actually dummy proof the full procurement process for you. This is not direct procurement and it's not donations. This is when you need to find the right suppliers for the right price, because when you receive donor money, you have to be compliant to the rules and regulations around procurement and getting quotations in. So that's the step where we're in, when you need to source for the best price for the best um, uh, ways to get them and get them to you in the best lead time. So there's a lot of steps in between where we guide you. There's all free material in it. You can uh, send out your, um, your quotation. You will see a dashboard that you can monitor how many suppliers have fed at your interest, how many bits you've received, but you will not be able to open those up because for accountability and transparency reasons, when due time has passed, you can do your supplier qualification. You can do your bit analysis and you can actually proceed to procuring for a, um, a good price um, with efficient and effective uh, processes in place. So what can uh, my call to action for you if you need any help with procurement? And I know this was extremely fast. I offer a demo with more lengthy explanation, of course, after this session, if you want. If you don't know the market or if you don't have a technical specialist at hand, we are always out there for you to help. And um, I'd just be super thankful to hear from you. and. Wish you all the best in all the operations you do globally. Thank you very much, Bailey. Thank you, Claire. Okay, just one moment. Get my screens all set up again. Okay. And Zoom wants to do this little fun check. Okay. Let's try this again. Okay, folks, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. Now we've got Ben. Ben Smilowitz is an executive director of smartresponse.org, a program of disaster accountability project. Ben launched Disaster Accountability Project, an independent watchdog to confront root causes of the failed Katrina response and improve disaster relief and humanitarian aid. DAP successfully advocated for the release of millions of dollars of aid funds investigating deficiencies in emergency planning and improved the transparency of nearly $2 billion of post-disaster donations. DAP's advocacy and OPEDs have been covered by global news media and its successes are attributable to hundreds of volunteers. Previously, Ben wrote successful legislation in Connecticut and created a youth cabinet in Missouri. Ben is a member of the Maryland Bar and an Echoing Green Fellow. He'll show us today smartresponse.org, which maximizes the impact of disaster relief donations, advances localization, and incentivizes transparency, benefiting millions of disaster survivors around the world. 
Fully independent of disaster relief and humanitarian organizations, Smart Response curates data-driven, localized how-to-help lists so donors can make more informed decisions about how and where to donate and directly support organizations responding locally without unnecessary intermediaries. Thanks for joining us today, Ben. Thanks, Bailey. It's great to be here. Uh, many thanks to TechSoup and Eli and Bailey for all you do to benefit the nonprofit and NGO sectors around the world. So my name is Ben Smilowitz. I started Disaster Accountability Project after Katrina as an advocacy organization to improve disaster relief and humanitarian aid. The need for independent oversight was essential to make sure lessons learned are not only learned, but implemented and changes are made to avoid repeating the same problems that result in preventable loss of life and suffering after disasters. Next, please. As you can see, we've, next please. Thank you. Uh, we've achieved quite a lot. We've worked on issues at all levels, from local, state, national, also global. And our investigations and reports after the Haiti earthquakes and Nepal earthquakes uh, illustrated the problem that we're addressing with our smart response platform. Next, please. While the reports um, are good for raising awareness, and they did, we wanted to change the way funds move on a global scale. And frankly, we just don't expect localization of humanitarian funds to happen on its own or by the efforts of the UN or international NGOs. The international community keeps missing deadlines for goals it sets for itself. The World Humanitarian Summit aimed to localize 25% of humanitarian funds by 2020, the numbers barely moved. Next, please. So this is our solution. Uh, we curate localized how to help lists so donors and other stakeholders can more easily identify and directly support NGOs on the ground. Uh, some call it democratizing disaster relief data and how to help lists that follow disasters in the US and globally are often junk. They include organizations soliciting donations with often no basis for whether those organizations are often are on the ground. Next, please. So this is what it looks like. This is our platform and uh, next. And this is a map of where we have organizations uh, on the platform. And this is the reach. In the first four years of existence, over 600 organizations from over 62 countries and 25 US states and territories have self-registered and most are sharing information. Next, please. This is an example of uh, just three countries and the uh, uh, distribution that we have in those, uh, in Bangladesh, Nepal, and India. Um, and those red dots are where groups identify as operating and that information helps us curate localized lists. Next, please. So for example, for the Southern Nigeria floods that happened towards the end of last year, uh, next. We identified the areas impacted by those floods and we use that map next to curate a list of organizations operating in those specific locations and we're not a part of the transaction process so when you click donate on those links you're going to those organizations directly and so we don't take a cut and we do this because we're trying to minimize the intermediaries in the process we want all the funds to go to them directly there's another uh, next please the Pakistan floods that we saw also last year. Uh, next, we identified where those floods impacted the country. Next, um, there'll be two pages next of organizations that people can engage with directly. And those profiles carry um, often similar to what a common grant application would include of data. Um, so this information is not just useful to donors, it can be used by survivors with internet access to identify organizations responding locally. Uh, just a few weeks ago, an, an organization that operates in Northwest Nepal responding to a December earthquake asked for help connecting with other, other local NGOs in Nepal. And we were able to connect them just with the information publicly available on the site now. Next. So the site was built by hundreds of volunteer developers and uh, many thanks to them. I think one of them, at least one of them is here listening to the webinar. Um, we've used a lot of the latest technologies Many thanks to TechSoup for all their support and um, all the offerings made available through them. But really this is thanks to hundreds of volunteers in over 20 countries that helped build the platform, helped recruit organizations, um, helped organizations complete their data. Next, please. And there are many ways to become involved. So we're looking for volunteers. And you know because we're a nonprofit and we don't take a percentage or fee and organizations don't pay, for their uh, involvement in the platform, we're looking for additional capacity support to scale so that we can go from where we are at 640 groups to over 2000 and implement a self-sustaining revenue model. So if anyone wants to chat, please get in touch. My email 
and uh, organizations can either nominate or people can nominate organizations or uh, organizations can just basically register on the platform and uh, just like needs list we go through a basic vetting process and happy to take questions. Thank you. A has been um, active throughout this whole time. So I'm just gonna grab some questions. They may have been answered in chat already, but I think there's value in answering them live. So let's see. Let's start with Yvonne's question for Kat. How do you get the information on the ground of what is needed? How often is that information updated and refreshed? Hey, great question. So organizations plug directly into the platform what they need and when they need it, and it's refreshed immediately. So the, the only delay is in vetting the organization to have them join. And then once they join, they can put as much as they want whenever they want it and it updates in real time. They can also set expiry dates and they can remove items. Thank you, Kat. Question. Um, okay, another question from Yvonne, this time for Ben. Um, what are the biggest challenges you face in operating smart response? How do you attract funders to your page? Yeah, so um, I guess the biggest challenge is that uh, it's all chicken egg, right? So organizations have an incentive to share data if they're getting resources. And the best uh, data that we collect is actually pre-disaster because think about it right now, no one's really available to sit down at a computer uh, from these local organizations on the ground in the middle of a disaster zone. Um, so we want organizations to think about sharing, taking the time to share information about themselves before a disaster happens, which many organizations, are, it's not on their radar until after something happens. Um, so convincing them to register um, and once they do, getting them to follow through and share the information needed. And so we work with them. We have volunteers working with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and then we also reach out to, to philanthropists from foundations and trusts to corporate CSR, found corporate social responsibility to individual uh, donors. And uh, we basically pitch these organizations. Um, so obviously it'd be great for people to build relationships with these organizations before events happen. But again, it's a big world sometimes, and people are not always thinking about different um, different regions all the time. So we're you know, putting organizations on the map and trying to get them visible when they would otherwise not be known. Thank you, Ben. Um, so the next question I have is was directly uh, targeted for Nicholas, but I'm going to start with Nicholas and kind of pose it to the rest of the group because I think there's value. Uh, what languages do you support? Looks like quite a few from the examples shown. Uh, yeah, so in my office here in the US, we will conduct Mapathon trainings in English, but because we're a big global organization as MSF, um, I have colleagues who lead Mapathon trainings in other languages, so colleagues who are doing it in Spanish, French, German, um, Arabic, for example, uh, probably a few others that I'm not sure about. Uh, based on who is doing mapathons. But um, in terms of the languages that are then supported, of course, you know, we'll map projects in, in our 70 plus uh, countries where we're working with MSF. So um, the map data is not necessarily tied to a language. And basically anyone can use the platform, anyone can contribute to the tasking manager site, and then those maps are used all over the world, depending on what the need is. Um, basically the, the team, the way that it's set up, the teams on the ground will say, hey, uh, we could use some updated maps of this area because we have a vaccination campaign coming up, or it's in direct response to a big emergency that's happened, like the recent earthquakes. Um, and so then the team of GIS specialists who work at MSF will put together the project and then uh, blast out to the mapping communities that we have to ask for support with that. Um, so yes, many languages, I guess, is the short answer. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, Claire, what about you? What languages is Solvez uh, available in? So the first page on the catalog is currently only in English, and we're about to, to make that available in multiple languages, among them uh, Chinese, Arabic, uh, French, Fr uh, Spanish. And the procurement platform itself is available in multiple languages. It's available in Spanish, in Italian, in um, not in Arabic yet, but it will be coming. So that's available in, in 
many, many languages uh, so far. Thank you. Pat. Um, so we've just launched in Ukraine in Ukrainian, Russian and English. Um, and then we are also available in French and Spanish and Portuguese and German. And soon we're going to be starting on languages that go in the opposite direction. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Ben. So we, we have a new version coming out with Ukrainian. I think already it's in Turkish, Indonesian, um, Spanish, French and um, Arabic and we're going to be switching to AWS for translation of everything. So not only the static text, but everything. And that will probably in the next year. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I have this other question. Let's see. Um, ben, what percentage of the how to help lists are fulfilled by the international community? It's a great question. So we make this information public and we pitch it to donor communities and to media because we want to inform those how to help lists so that more information can get out there. What's unique about our site is that we're not proposing to touch that money once people donate. People go directly to those organizations. So we're left out of that process. And I couldn't tell you um, how much is flowing because we're not, we, we're, we, we're not party to the transactions. So Ultimately, organizations can report back, donors can tell us if they're going through our page to find those organizations, but ultimately our goal is to increase the visibility of these organizations so that donors engage them directly. Thank you. Um, so the last question I'm gonna uh, pose to the group um, and I'll start with Claire. Um, are your organizations open integration with other nonprofit sponsored disaster apps? Yeah, for me, that's an absolute yes. So we are already two platforms that are integrated into one. So we have an active API. And for me, within logistics, um, supply chain, in uh, this whole movement of goods, interoperability um, is critical if we are to do anything. So it's an absolute no-brainer, yes. Thank you. Nicholas. Yeah, it's for us, I, I would say pr not so much um, from my experience. It's there are other applications and other sites that you can use um, that help you be more efficient when you're updating the GIS data. But really, the functionality of the tasking manager and the and the, um, the map swipe mobile app, that's really just where it is. I don't know that they would be integrated into other disaster preparedness specifically uh applications but that makes sense. it might be possible <laughs> i'm not sure okay um cat we'd be really happy to i think we'd need to find some funding for development costs is the only thing because of course it's it's not usually just as some straightforward as that but yeah we're really really open to it if people want to thank you ben so our platform is designed so that all the data is already publicly available and open. A lot of platforms you have to log in and create profiles and all that to access. Um, but we do have a, a widget on every um, disaster page that people can use and plug anywhere so that the how to help list will stream elsewhere. We're open to other partnerships and we have an amazing developer team of volunteers around the world that can build APIs. So if, if there's interest in partnership, please reach out. Thank you. Okay, so now I welcome all the participants to go ahead and put something in chat that you learned today. I'm going to give it a couple of minutes and then I'll read a couple of those out loud. Um, we have a request from Jack uh, for Nicholas's contact information. Um, again, we'll share all the slides in a recording um, and there's some contact information in the chat as well. Um, Yvonne says organizations are hesitant to share data unless they believe that it will get resources in return. Um, there we go. Thank you, Andrew, for providing that. Uh, Lars, there are some excellent platforms out there and with very broad scope. Ben, yeah, that's a good point. I think part of the reason for that is capacity. So many strapped financially. Um, Octavia, I learned that there are great works being done and you have to be aware of it to be into it. Absolutely. 
Okay. And also Nicholas uh, provided some contact information specifically about missing maps, if that was uh, what the inquiry is more geared towards. Okay. So did you like what you saw today and want to support future demo events and reach nonprofits curious about technology? Consider becoming a sponsor for a future event. Please contact Susan Tinby for more information at community at techsoup.org. And thank you again, especially to those behind the scene producers and staff at TechSoup who made this event possible. So the last thing before we say goodbye is please be sure to complete our post event survey. We're going to put a link to it in the chat, but also when you close your zoom application, a pop up will appear to complete that survey. So please, it's really valuable feedback and helps us for future events. And as a final reminder, we'll be sharing the replay from today's event with slides, any links via email within the few uh, business days. So thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you again next time.